Is religion in our genes? That is the core question of this video. Why did I come up with that question? First of all, because I wrote a book that touches this issue. It's called It's All in the Genes, really, and this is the table of contents. And one of the chapters focuses on this question. It's much more detailed than this video. You can find this book either at genesispc.com or wheredowecomefrom.com. There is a book version and an ebook version for Kindle. The question is based on a 2005 book of the human geneticist Dean Hammer. He gave it the title The God Gene, How Faith is Hardwired in Our Genes. This hypothesis was basically invented by Hammer, who now claims he has in fact discovered a gene that he decided to call the God Gene. How did he come to that conclusion? He theorized that if our sense of spirituality has a genetic basis, then those who rank higher in spirituality should share the same genetic link that others don't have. He measured spirituality by using a scale developed by a psychologist, a self-transcendence scale, in order to quantify how spiritual someone is. So he based that on the assumption that spirituality is identical to belief in God. Then he limited his search to nine genes that produce monoamines that identified one gene, VMAT2, that had a high correlation with affinity for spirituality. And then he discovered that there was a nucleic acid that was replaced by another one in people who had a high affinity for spirituality. I think there are many problems with his claims. First of all, that gene is basically a pump responsible for packaging neurotransmitters in brain activity. In that specific sense, it is an important gene and it may play a role when people have religious experiences. But is it a gene for God? It's clear that concepts of God do reside in your brain, certainly not in your toe. But that does not tell us where they ultimately come from. Problem number two, when it comes to religion, the cultural, cultural environment is particularly important. It has been hard to link individual genes to personalities. So how can we possibly link them to religion? There are too many intervening steps involved. Other genes, effects of other gene expressions, cultural factors, personal elements. Then there is problem number three. Hammer has proved himself to be an expert in inventing genes. Once it was a gay gene, now it's a God gene. Unfortunately for him, the field of behavioral genetics is littered with failed links with behavioral traits. We have been bombarded with genes for homosexuality, for autism, for schizophrenia, and the list goes on and on. Problem number four, even if it were true that we are genetically hardwired for religion, what could this mean? Clearly we are not hardwired for a particular religion. There are more than 7,000 different kinds of religions. Born a Catholic does not mean always a Catholic. Plenty are the cases of people who decide to become atheists or decide to do the opposite by taking on a religion. Does that mean their genes? have changed? Problem number five. All this genetic talk has nothing to do with God. Perhaps it can tell us something about mystical or spiritual experiences, but the idea that people believe in God because of those experiences is foolish. One need not feel anything, let alone have a mystical experience to believe in the existence of God. Most people who believe in God have never experienced God in a mystical way. Some believe in God or reject God purely for intellectual reasons. Others have an intuitive awareness of God's existence. There are many ways in which we come to a belief in God. Then there is problem number six. The feeling of transcendence, 
or mystical or spiritual experience is not necessarily a religious experience. And if Hammer is right, it is in fact merely a biological one. All the neurotransmitters involved in the feeling of self-transcendence are scrambled, are the same ones that are scrambled by ecstasy, LSD and other mind-altering drugs. If the feeling of transcendence is a biological experience rather than a religious experience, then all these studies prove is that they are about biology and not about religion. Problem number seven. Why is it that Hammer wants to reduce religion to something like spiritual experiences? Probably because he is convinced that science can explain everything in life, even religion. That's the view that all reality can be reduced to a scientific explanation and is only a matter of material entities. But not everything is material. If there is only material stuff in this universe, there is no longer room for spiritual reality. Problem number eight. Believing God is definitely more than a mere belief or spiritual feeling. It must have a basis in reality. Otherwise, it's about nothing but feelings. Hammer actually redefines religion in spiritual terms. And he says it's part of one, being part of one great totality, and that's it. Ironically, Hammer seems to leave room for something spiritual, but then he explains it away as merely something material. Isn't that odd? Problem number nine. Hammer's work is motivated by an atheistic philosophy of materialism. It says matter is all there is. That's materialism. And that leads automatically to the idea that the need for God is what created the idea of God. He declares the God of religion a mere product of genes and brains. When religion tells us that we were made in God's image supporters of this atheistic view would point out that God was actually made in our own image, a mere illusion, as Freud called it, or a delusion, as Dawkins called it. Problem number 10. How could there be truth to what science claims if everything were merely material? Just as there is no way for true or false or being right or wrong to exist if matter is all there is, so there is no way for the divine to exist. Genes can never produce truths and untruths. The best genes could ever produce for religion are neural activities. But then we are no longer talking religion. So I am using here a kind of reasoning that I paraphrased according to the biologist G.B. Haldane and C.S. Lewis. They say very strongly, if I believe that my religious belief come from genes, then my belief cannot be true. Hence, I do not have to believe that my beliefs come from genes, not even my religious beliefs. I paraphrased this, they didn't put it this way, but their way of reasoning goes this way. I think it's very compelling. So we have to come to a conclusion after all these ten objections. Those who embrace materialism, I would ask, how can matter ever explain itself, its own existence? It cannot just pop up out of nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. Since I do not see how matter could ever explain itself, I, it would need an explanation beyond itself. A solely material universe is essentially an absurd universe, an irrational universe. So therefore there is only one rational alternative. Only the existence of God can explain that there is a universe, that there is order in this universe. That this universe is intelligible, that we can understand it, that there are laws of nature, and that there are moral laws. Where else would they come from if it's not from God? Did our genes ever make us come to such a conclusion? Don't believe it.
we did not touch God with our imagination, with our feelings. It was God who touched us. We did not touch God. It is God who touched us. As I said at the beginning, you can find much more about what I just said in the book. It's all in the genes. You can find it at these two or at Amazon.com. The book is regular retail price $14.95. The ebook is $9.95. But Amazon may have discounts.